from the December 6, 1989 episode of Later with Bob Costas. First generation rock and roller Dion recounts the genre's birth, how he personally took, you know, the blues and, and especially jazz, which was most impressive, was him talking about how he took the uh, jazz, hop, swing, blues kind of saxophone and transferred those into vocal parts behind him on especially his earlier hits. He, he talks about uh, his drug abuse, his coming out of it, and writing a song of social change, you know, Abraham, Martin, and John. Um, talks about his friendship with Lou Reed. He talks about New York and being New Yorkers. And uh, I think Dion does not get his due. He's right up there with Buddy Holly and Chuck Berry. He's sort of like New York's rock and roller. Can't think of anyone else who really was. So, Also fascinating, he talks about an early MTV-ish MTV -ish experiment called Televox that he says lasted about a month. It did have one video of him walking uh, or riding on an airplane while stewardesses has walked down the aisle trying to meet his needs. And uh, he, he chooses the alcohol after uh, the food, but fascinating seeing him smoke a cigarette and the way it used to be on an airplane but uh, everything's the way it used to be hey i would enjoy later with bob costas december 6 1989 dion's one cool cat Thanks for staying up later. We're joined tonight by Dion. Let's start at the beginning. Where'd the Belmonts come from? Right up the street here, Belmont Avenue. <laughs> Belmont Avenue in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they were just on the outskirts of a neighborhood that I grew up in, the Fordham section. And they were the best of the street corner singers. You know, I kind of collected them from different neighborhoods. One was Tremont uh, Avenue, and then Angelo came more from the concourse area. So that was the tenor. And uh, that was the beginning of Dion and the Belmonts. What do you think is distinctive? And I know it's hard, and I'm sort of asking you to be immodest, but what do you think is distinctive about your sound on The Wanderer, on Runaround Sue? most of which is post Belmont's. Now you're just Dion. This is after Teenager in Love, and now you're off doing some rougher edge stuff. What is it that's distinctive about your work that separates it from the garden variety pop of the early 60s? Well, as if my, my music is, that I look back on it now, it's kind of like black music filtered through an Italian neighborhood, comes out with an attitude. And I had a little country mixed in because uh, I did a lot of listening to Hank Williams. So when you got a song like The Wanderer or Run Around Sue, what you were getting, you know, there was a lot of, uh, uh, I, at that time I, I was talking, to, uh, I got connected with songwriters like Doc Palmas, who was uh, very influenced by Joe Turner and the big band blues sounds and stuff. So I was listening to a lot of uh, jazz, blues, uh, the, the early sax players like um, Big Al Sears and Red Prysock, and they would, they had these kind of swing uh, tunes, you know. Mm -hmm. And they, they do all that kind of stuff. So I did it with, I, I couldn't afford a, a horn section. So I got a few of the guys in the neighborhood and we'd, so we and then everybody jump in and take a part so it's kind of mixed it has like rock and roll because i like the electrical you know the, the guitars just had come out at that time the fender guitar and uh i used this poor man's horn section which were the guys in my neighborhood and myself so it's kind of a, a mixture of uh uh, all those elements. I don't all know what it is. All untrained guys? I mean, these weren't well, schooled singers. Well, the musicians. Singers. No, the singers were just from the neighborhood. And I'd just give them parts because I was hearing these horn parts. Guys like on the stoop, right? Yeah, for instance, uh, exactly. For instance, like a song like Ruby Baby. The background is... 
Ruby, 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 baby. Ruby, 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 baby. Now the horn section would be going. Da 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 da. Where are you going to find a horn section in the Bronx, in an Italian neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> All they had was feasts, and they'd walk. You know, we had the feast with a thousand elderly old women in, uh, in black dresses with rosary and da 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 musicians with the horns. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... Were, were you influenced, too, by uh, some of the black harmony groups of the 50s, you know, the, the Cadillacs and, and groups oh, like yeah, that, definitely. Cleftones? Definitely. Uh, but one, I'll tell you something about that, but the, only, the other thing I wanted to mention is the, the musicians that were used were jazz musicians uh, that were playing at the Apollo Theater in Harlem, uh, like Stick Sevens on drums, who had, in Panama, Francis, who had their own jazz group. So when you, when you hear a thing like The Wanderer, there's some wonderful things happening on, like kids come up to me today. I mean, I say kids, but I'm first generation rock and roller fourth generation rock and rollers they said what was that guy doing on the drums yeah well the guy who knows what he was doing he was a jazz he was great drummer i he, read somewhere that the first time you met springsteen he walks up to you and he wants to know what the drum riff is on the wanderer that very thing right well no actually i was uh not the first time i met uh uh bruce but one time i was doing a rehearsal and he was standing right out in front of me and he was kind of playing an imaginary cymbal and playing an imaginary guitar riff. And I realized what he was doing. He was playing something that the band in back of me was not playing. So, I, you know, I asked him about it. He said, listen, you know, that's how we went to school. We, we listened to these records. To us, they're, uh, they're perfect, you know. Uh, that was our schooling, so don't be surprised if we know everything that's on those records. And I, I, I can understand that. I relate to that in a sense, because that's what I did with the records that I listened to. You talk about the Cadillacs and stuff. The only thing, I digested all I could, could get from those guys, except, there's one exception. When I first worked the Apollo Theater, the Isley Brothers closed that show, and they were awesome. They'd have to rebuild the stage after these guys left it. During the instrumental break, they would speak spin around, do splits, and one guy would hold imaginary strings and bounce them up and down like a yo-yo. Right. I thought it was so cool, man, that after the show, I ran upstairs into the dressing room, closed the door, got in the middle of the floor, spun around, did a split. Now, one thing a short, squatty Italian guy should not do is spin around and do no split. Because Especially when he's wearing those peg pants. <laughs> I haven't been able to walk the same <laughs> since, but I sing much higher. It's, it was a good thing. There was always a natural cool about what you did. And like I said earlier, there's garden variety pop, some of which is catchy. And then there's stuff that has a certain earthiness about it, and it's true. You, you know it's not a, a pose. It's yeah. not something that someone contrived. It's just true. And there's a grittiness about The Wanderer and about Run Around Sue and Ruby Baby and some of those other songs. And, and I guess that's the reason why you have credibility with guys a generation and a half later, why you can go on stage at Madison Square Garden and suddenly Springsteen and Billy Joel and Paul Simon and Lou Reed become the Belmonts. They become your backup singers. Yeah, that, that was kind of a major moment for me. It's, it's awesome rehearsing with a huddle of guys of, uh, that you respect like that. You know, that I've been listening to their music, you know. They've been keeping me young. And rich in spirit and thinking and feeling and so you know when they huddled in a group and start going Ooh, and i'm looking around there's billy joe who sings great huh? and, and i didn't think bruce springsteen could really carry something like that you know i thought it was just rough but he got in there and paul simon james taylor and lou reed and uh they wanted to be belmonts you know i'm glad i didn't have to pay them that's all I was yeah <laughs> Reed, uh, Reed's the guy that introduced you at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a couple years later, right? Lou Reed's a good friend. He's, uh, he's somebody that, uh, you, know, you know, goes beyond the business, beyond just the surface. It's somebody that I could, you know, we call each other, we talk, we cut away the garbage, uh, transcends, uh, it, it keeps you real. What did it mean to you? And in, in touch. What did it mean to you to be officially recognized 
you know, they've, they've taken in the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Elvis and Chuck Berry. You're talking about the real certified people. Now you're on that list, too. Uh, it felt, it, for me, it felt great. Uh, it, was, it was a real special night for me because, uh, I don't know, especially being first-generation rock and roller, I think it's uh, kind of difficult for the later-generation rock and rollers to appreciate a time when there were no expectations, no rules, no monitors. You didn't even get paid most of the time. But uh, so, in, to validate and to you know to re in that recognition, you know, his his guys. I'm looking out at this audience. I've been listening to uh, the artists in this audience and uh, respecting a lot of the producers out there for for decades, and they've come to say thank you. Yeah. to me and saying thank you for touching our lives and our spirit and our hearts uh, it was it was a nice feeling you feel connected you feel like you contributed something that because it's sharing yourself and somebody says thank you it's feels good back with Dion DiMucci somebody told me that it was actually part of your strategy to include the names of women in song titles run around Sue Ruby baby Donna the prima donna for a very simple reason. Write a song about Donna, there's got to be at least 200,000 Donnas out there. You know, 200,000 sales. Pow! <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, early rock and roll is a funny thing. Uh, today, if you write a lyric, you could use some awareness, you know. Uh, back then, uh, the sole source of our inspiration was the alphabet. If you take uh, the letter B, I mean, uh, that was a good song. A B was sounds good, good to me. <laughs> you take uh, a D. You, know, right? you get an L. La 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 la. That was a love song. An L. So la 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 la. Lovely Linda. Yeah. There you go. So you get twelve letters. You got an album. It was simple. Then you you know it started getting complicated when we started running out of letters and co combinations, you start like tra la 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 tha na ma ma nu tha ma na ma na thu thu tha ni tha ma na ma ma tra la tha ne tha ma na ma thu thu tha ma ma ni And then when you ran out of all that stuff, we started using girls' names. <laughs> you know, you went to Rosie. By, by, by the standards of the day, you were kind of swarthy and maybe a little dangerous. You know, Bobby V was one thing, yeah. and James Darren or, uh, or whomever was another. But Dion had a little, no. uh, maybe a little bit of danger about him to some, some gal in Des Moines, Iowa. The yeah, well, directors. you get to the Midwest, you get this oily, olive-skinned Italian guy coming in singing The Wander. They go, how don't you go see that? You know? It kind of defiant lyrics, too. I mean, it isn't like, please love me. It's like, hey, if I've got any use for you, fine. And if not, I'll just hop right into that car of mine and drive around the world. You know, uh, I, think it's, I think it's funny, that song. I, you know, I, to me, you know, I... It's, it's, you can't take it serious. It, actually, it's, it's written about a guy, he was a sailor in my neighborhood. It was one sailor. And uh, he was going out with Mary, and he had Mary tattooed on his left arm. Uh, or Flo on my left arm. He had Mary, uh, Flo, put on his arm. He broke off with her, and he had Flo covered up with a panther. And he went out with Mary, put Mary on his right arm, had... And he broke off with her. He had Mary covered up with a pair of dice or something, you know. And then, a, <laughs> then he went out with Janie, and he had it covered up with a dagger. He, he went, and then he finally went out with this girl Rosie. He had Rosie tattooed on his chest. And when he broke off with her, he got it. He got Rosie like covered up with his battleship. How about one of the early videos, Ruby Baby? Remember that video? Of course you do. But it pops up from time to time now, like on VH1, where you're walking yeah. down the aisle of a plane. Well, that, that was uh, the first attempt at videos, to see music. I guess uh, we, we did this video in France. They rented a jet with 14 stewardesses, and we did it. And it, it, originally, it was called uh, the Telly Box. They had, uh, you could go down here on Broadway, throw a quarter in the jukebox, and they have a screen on top of it. They were trying it out, and Ruby Baby would uh, pop up, and uh, you'd see it. But it only lasted about a month. Uh, uh, for some reason, it didn't work. I don't know why. The, yeah. the concept. We but later, it came out as MTV, you know. You were close at hand the day the music died. The plane crash that took the lives of Richie Valens and the Big Bopper and uh, Buddy Holly. 
I was on that tour for two weeks uh, with those guys, and it was a very exciting uh, time for me because we all had hit records. We all were from different parts of the country. I, here I am from an Italian uh, Catholic neighborhood in, in Bronx, New York City. Buddy Holly was from Lubbock, Texas, from a small town. He had a whole different upbringing. Uh, Richie Valance was from the San Fernando Valley out in uh, the Barrio section in California, L.A. And uh, we all had different uh, styles of music, and we were just soaking it up. It was the, the bus was, you know, we, we, had, we had the first Fender guitars that came out. We were in a contest to see who could make them ring the longest. We were on that bus. There was more rhythm, guitars happening, and m more song swapping and idea swapping you, you ever heard. It was a very exciting time for me, and people would be surprised at how primitive the conditions were. This wasn't lavish we were on a rock star bus. condition, like a no, school no, bus, school and bus yeah. low pay days, and guys sleeping in the luggage rack and everything. There was no sound system. It was like turn on the switch, turn the mic on. You know, that was it. You know, yeah. turn the lights on. There was no light show. You know, but uh, the music was uh, it was awesome. After that fatal plane crash, when I arrived in uh, Fargo, North Dakota, and heard the plane went down. Because Buddy had asked me to, to, you know, get on that plane and split the cost, and I think the, it was $35, and that was like a magical number in my head because my parents were paying $35 a month rent in Bronx, New York City, and my head hadn't stretched out to understand, you know, just to get over there, I got to pay 35 that's a month's rent. It just didn't uh, make sense to me at that time. So in a sense, $35 saved my life, but... When, uh, when I heard the plane went down, that was baffling for a 19-year-old uh, at that time. I, I, my girl, who was my, my girl at that time, was my wife today. I was dating her at the time. She tells me till this day that I was like in shock for two weeks after I got home. Because uh, we really got close and, and uh, you know, you feel like you're on top of the world. And the next minute, the rug is pulled out from under you. Continuing with Dion, it's well documented about the troubles that you had with drugs and that and a combination, I guess, of the British invasion and other forces in music kind of pushed you out of the public eye for a while. Then you got yourself back together and the public reemergence was Abraham, Martin and John in the late 60s. Yeah, when I came out of that drug thing, I kind of was hurled into a, maybe a different world, maybe kind of, I, I started to approach like some songwriting from a, a spiritual uh, place. Instead of just... People talk about, you're a survivor. I think there's more to it than just surviving. To me, it was like I started to live above the circumstances. In other words, like, uh, well, I'm doing fine under the circumstances. I, I'm not under the circumstances. I wanted to know what life really had to offer, you know, just to find out what it was really about. Uh, a place, I knew there was a, a state uh, that I could get to where... You know, there was some peace and there was some serenity and some that I would, I would have uh, a good sense of who I was and, and just truly being free. And uh, this is what started happening after that drug thing turned around. And uh, Abraham, Martin, and John, I think, was uh, the result of that experience because it was a bad situation and I tried to approach it with a solution in mind, saying, hey, John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Lincoln. These people had a dream. They knew there was a state of love that, that does exist. It's for us to make it real. And they died short of seeing that dream realized. But I'm like everybody else. I wanted to just pick up on the dream and, and take it further. So that was what that song was about. True story. The first record I ever bought, nine years old, 1961, Run Around Sue. I think it cost 49 cents. And as a matter of fact, it's still on this jukebox. You want to do the honors? See you later.